Welcome to Plant Your Seed. I'm your host, Fred Ferris. On each episode, we share stories of how ordinary people have transformed their lives. Each story is compassionate, each story is authentic, and each story is a transformation. Here are the stories of the people who are changing our world by transitioning to a plant-based diet. Today, I share the story of Ashley Piper. Ashley's a political strategist turned eco-lifestyle journalist and TV personality. She's also the author of Give a Shit, Do Good, Live Better, Save the Planet. She baby-stepped her way into becoming vegan about 10 years ago and hasn't looked back. Here's Ashley's transformative story. Today on Plant Your Seed, we have best-selling author Ashley Piper. Hi. Ashley's book, Give a Shit, Do Good, <laughs> Live Better, Save the Planet is an amazing practical handbook for the everyday person. So uh, welcome to the show, Ashley. Thank you, Fred. It's a pleasure to be here. I am so excited to have you. So happy to have you here on the show. I, I can't even tell you. I I, um, I absolutely love the book. Um, I find it to be uh, like a reference to just like there's just so many great parts to it. Um, but... We'll get to that in a little bit. I have so <laughs> many, so many other questions that are going. Let's, uh, let's. We have a lot of stuff to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Let's start from the beginning. Um, okay. How long have you been vegan? So it's been almost a decade. Okay. Um, now, and I say almost because I, uh, you know, there are some people who are like, it's my vegan anniversary, you know, and they know exactly the day they went vegan for me. Even to vegetarianism, even to pescatarianism, it was not like a hard start. It wasn't like, this is the day I'm going to do it. It kind of was a slow phase out. Uh -huh. and there were some mess ups in between. So to be more conservative, I like to say it's almost been a decade. Right. So you just kind of slowly transitioned over as opposed to, I know that myself, a couple other people that I've talked to, um, just kind of decided one day, that's it. Yeah, which is great. I actually, I kind of envy that in a way um, because I just didn't, I'd always wanted to become vegetarian and then vegan. It was like, no joke, something I would put on my New Year's resolutions every <laughs> year. And then I just like wouldn't. So I'm always in such, I'm always so inspired by people who have just a really hard start. They're like, this is the day I'm changing my life. I think that's really cool. Yeah, I'm, now, why why did you become vegan? I mean, like, here you are, you're vegetarian, you're going around, and mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you decide. I, I mean, yeah, you have this idea that you, like you said, you you want to be vegan, but why was it? Like, what was the trigger? What really, I guess, made you go and do it? Yeah. Um... Well, it was, I had a, I had always, I had wanted to for a long time. I had a, a few very inspiring friends who were vegans and vegetarians. And to me at the time, it seemed like, oh, just so hard, so impossible. Um, Cause I'm like a meat lover through and through. I'm from Texas. So mm -hmm. for me to have any kind of meal, even like breakfast without meat was like weird. Um, but I, there were a few things. So I had adopted my dog, Banjo, and, you know, she's just so bright and emotive and smart. And I just, I started to see like every animal in her and vice versa. Um, so I think she was actually like a big reason. And part of the reason why I dedicate the book to her, aside from her just being very important in my life, is that she was a big reason for me. Um, I don't know, just, just feeling like it was the right time to do it. And I had always had animals growing up and felt very close to them, but she's like my first pet as like my own as an adult. So that was inspiring to me to kind of get with the program there. And I, you know, was, had been very active in a lot of animal rights kinds of things for a long time. You know, I grew up, um, in a household where my mom was constantly like kind of the neighborhood animal rescuer. Mm -hmm. And um, we would always adopt anim companion animals from shelters. And, you know, at a, a pretty early age, like when I was living in Boston, I was pretty active in peaceful fur protests mm -hmm. and circus protests and things like that, um, like wouldn't go to aquariums. So all these other animal rights issues. But yet then after the fur protest, I would go and get a burger. Like it just I still had that cognitive dissonance or that disconnect around 
the animals we eat versus the animals we advocate for in right. a fashion context or in an entertainment context. So, I, you know, it was a, a bit of a long transition for me because I would kind of firmly feel like I had finally gotten into vegetarianism and then I would mess up, you know? And so uh, that's why I feel like I stress to people, you know, look, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be in one night. If you can do it, then that's amazing. Right. But um, even if you're just phasing out, like consciously trying to phase out more animal products, I think that's amazing and does a really good service to the environment. So, but it was animal rights that got me there. Um, for sure. And my kind of personal commitment to that. And then after I'd been vegan for a while, I started to just see all of the other benefits I got. I felt a lot better and I'm by no means a health vegan, um, more power to those folks, but I'm, right. you know, you and me for a week ago, the Chicago diner and I would be throwing down <laughs> on some of that stuff. I have like no problem with like, you know, vegan junk food or whatever. I think it's great. Um, and, uh, you know, all the environmental aspects of it, the resource inequity aspects, like I just feel like it was a lifestyle that fit so well with my just belief system on all sorts of things from social justice to human rights to, you know, even feminism. So it it just stuck because it kept feeling right for me. Right. Uh, OK, so take us back to that day when you're st- sitting there, I guess, with your dog and, Mm -hmm. and you actually put it together. You, you all of a sudden that disconnect between that package (laughs) of meat in the store. I mean, and and that's so, so amazing because that is so true with like everyone. And I know it was Mm -hmm. true for me. It's like, you're like, I don't know, save the dolphin, save this, save that. And then you go, (laughs) go to the store and you just, you don't have that connection of this is, an actual fish or this is an actual piece of meat that was an animal. You're just like, it's a package in the store. So take us back to that moment when you're, you're there with the, with your dog and all of a sudden you put it together. I, I, I don't know if there was one single moment. I think there were a lot of little moments throughout my life where certain things that I had accepted as normal always felt like wrong to me. And like, for instance, I grew up kind of fishing with my dad. That was something that we did because it was like a fun, a fun, quote unquote, father daughter um, bonding right. opportunity for us. And we'd wake up early and we'd go fishing. And I remember we were in Galveston and he was fishing kind of in the ocean. I remember walking up to him and he had caught a small fish. My dad's a good person. You know, he caught a small fish. And right then and there, he's cutting that fish up while it's alive and using it as bait. And I remember even to this day, that was probably, gosh, like almost, you know, 30 years ago or something. But I remember seeing the fish and the blood and like the look on the fish's face and remember feeling like, oh, shit, this feels really wrong to me, even at that young age. Um, right. And there were other things, too. I think what really moved me toward that, in addition to my dog, is I started watching a lot of the undercover um, footage of, you know, of factory farming. Uh, I've watched a lot of videos from like PETA and mercy for animals. And, um, now I don't watch those because I find them to be incredibly depressing and it's like preaching to the choir. Um, I think they're really, really important for shedding light on the reality of what happens to animals all, all the time, every day. Um, but yeah, I was really in a place where I was watching those a lot. And so those uh, as depressing and hard to watch as they were, um, kept me honest they kept me close to like what what my why for making the choice to become vegetarian and later vegan. Right now, because I mean, like everybody has a why. For me, it was health. Uh, obviously, for you, it was animal rights. Mm-hmm. Um, now, what what do you think is the biggest challenge that you've had? You know, like since you've been vegan. Um, I don't know. New York cheese pizza is for me. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I don't know about yeah. you, but, but that's like one of those things that I, I look at and I'm like, Oh, New York cheese. I only New York. I'm sorry, Chicago, but that's all um, right. You got to have your thing. <laughs> I grew up in New York. So that was, uh, that was my thing. And I just yeah. look at it and I'm just like, okay, no, but what, what is your biggest challenge? I mean, cheese is a challenge, and I think it's becoming less so um, because there are a lot of great 
alternatives on the market. I mean, 10 years ago, I would say the vegan cheese situation was really bleak. Right. Yeah, it was pretty yeah. bleak. And we <laughs> didn't have all these like delicious things like the Impossible Burger and Beyond Meat. And so we didn't have that stuff like when I first kind of embarked on this. Um, so, yeah, for me, what is kind of tough? Like what sometimes do I feel like is tough? Um, it would be cheese. It would probably be like Texas style queso for me. Like when I go back home and visit and my whole family's going out for Tex-Mex, mm-hmm. um, I definitely have like, you know, I definitely enjoy like s- the smells of the cuisine because <laughs> it takes <laughs> me back. Right. Um, but before it was cheese, it was actually like just a good meaty feeling burger. And, uh, since, because again, I was like a meat lover, even when I was starting to live on my own, I would go and buy, I sound so gross to talk about, but I would go and buy like a pack of really crummy ground beef and cook it up with onions and top it with cheese. And I would eat that for like many meals. That's how much I was like, uh, I'm like, I'm like a vegan who loved meat. It Mm -hmm. wasn't like, Oh, I didn't like meat. And so I became vegetarian. I really liked it. So the advent of like the Impossible Burger and Gardein and all these great, very meaty substitutes have actually been really kind of squelched those cravings for me. Um, And I think make it really easy for people to, you know, give it a whirl. Yeah, I I totally agree. Um, Now, there's something that I found interesting that you just said that you're you're a huge meat person, but then you went vegetarian. Like what? What kind of like, cause I know that a lot of people, it's a texture thing and they don't like yeah. the texture of the meat and everything like that. And then they go vegetarian. So what, what happened, um, to make you go vegetarian then? Animal rights. Like, I mean, it's so it's, so my whole trajectory was like, I went from being like a hardcore meat eater to, to basically knowing that I was so like, so just crazy about animals, didn't want to hurt them anymore. I knew our food system was broken and really cruel. And I baby stepped my way into becoming pescatarian, then later vegetarian, then later vegan. And at the time, I knew I always wanted to become vegan. I already knew like, the dairy industry, the egg industry was unbelievable. Like, they were unbelievably cruel. Um, And byproducts, essentially, of like us, you know, the they were like being vegetarian, you're still feeding the the dairy and the egg industry. So I knew I wanted to be vegan. But for me, I had to take kind of like steps to get there. So I used to make my own like meats out of seitan and stuff, Mm -hmm. which to people who've been vegetarian or vegan for a very long time, that's no big shakes. (laughs) You know, but (laughs) But nowadays, people are like, oh, I just go to the store and I buy like a really great meat substitute. Um, so, yeah, it was it was definitely a process for me. And that's why I say, oh, I've been vegan for nearly a decade because there before that there was probably a gray area of a year or so where I was pescatarian, vegetarian and then trying vegan, but had quite a few setbacks. Right. Right. It, with all of those. As you, as you do, as happens. Yeah, sure. Because, I mean, you have that emotional connection, as you were saying, um, with food and growing up. Like, you have that barbecue smell or whatever. And mm-hmm. and there and there is that attraction. Um, and I, I get it. But when it comes down to kind of looking around and, and realizing that, you know, there are other things going on in the world. And you mentioned um, feminism. And I think that to me is, is a really big issue with the way the cows are treated. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's interesting to me how many women will have children and then they'll really, then maybe before they had children, they knew, um, what was happening in the dairy industry that these cows are, you know, forcibly inseminated, meant to stand like made to stand for you know basically their whole lives in waste they're constantly pregnant and then their children are taken away from them and the milk is essentially stolen and given to us so like i know a lot of women who knew that was the reality of the dairy industry before they got pregnant then they got pregnant and they had children and i think this like extra empathy kicked in of like holy shit i can't imagine somebody one doing that to me and two trying to take my child from me like how distressing must that be so it's very, you know, I, I just feel like I'm big into, I'm big into equality. And so I feel 
if we're going to say it's wrong to do that to a person, I would say it's pretty wrong to do that to an animal as well. No, yeah. It's hard to, once you, once you get there, it's hard to understand it. It, it doesn't make any mm-hmm. sense. Um, mm-hmm. why do you, th- I agree with you. Why do you think so many people are starting to turn towards a plant-based diet these days? Um, wh- what makes it so popular? Well, I think there are, you know, there are well-documented health benefits and longevity benefits to a more plant-based diet. Like we have such a body of longitudinal studies now that basically show that if you're eating largely vegan, and maybe less on the process side of things, your chances of living longer and having fewer illnesses are are pretty, you know, they're statistically greater than the standard American diet. So I think a lot of people arrive to this lifestyle out of health. And I see this just anecdotally when I'll meet people and they find out I'm vegan and they're like, oh, I should do that. And I'm like, why do you, why do you feel like you should do that? And they're like, ah, because it's just healthier. So I think there's kind of this, you know, people think if you're vegan, you're going to be like, really slim and really athletic or really healthy and vibrant. And that's not always the case. Right. Um, but I do think a lot of people turn to it for health reasons. I mean, statins are basically like, like one of the top prescribed drugs in the world. And uh, that shows me we have like a cholesterol problem, obviously. Right. Um, and what better way to control cholesterol than to have a diet that's basically completely devoid of external cholesterol. Your body's always going to make some and there are genetics at play, of course, but, you know, in a plant based in a in a vegan diet, I say that because a plant based diet allows for some room for animal products. But a vegan diet, you're not getting any external cholesterol because you only get those from animal products. So I do see how it's appealing to people from like a health standpoint. And I think there are a lot of people now and I'm excited to see this who from an ecological standpoint are like, oh, crap, yeah, like, I guess animal agriculture is killing the planet. And so, you know, the advent and popularity of Meatless Mondays and, you know, these other kinds of movements, people are saying it's pretty easy now to eat, like, you know, one or two meals a day that are vegetarian, and they see that it's better for the planet. And so I think that also is the rise in popularity. And the fact that there, you know, there are a lot of really delicious things you can eat that are vegan, uh, you know, and just the availability and abundance of options. So you can go to Burger King and get a vegan burger. You can go to Dunkin' Donuts to get a vegan breakfast sandwich. You know, you can go to now KFC is launching like a vegan bucket of chicken. And, and so we're giving people accessible options that taste just as good, if not better. And in some cases are better, a little bit better for you. And I, I think people are, are saying, you know, why the heck not? And they're trying it and finding out how simple it can be um, and enjoyable. And so I think there are a lot of reasons why people are coming to it. But health and environment, I think, are the main ones these days. Right. I, I found that when I talk to people, they they say that they have more energy and therefore they don't feel like just, I don't know, vegging out on the couch. They They find like themselves like, oh, I... I got to go do something and I don't know, they'll mm-hmm. go take a hike. They'll, I don't know, work out. And there's just a lot of things that happen from that. And it's just from putting good things into your body. Um, mm-hmm. that's, that's what, uh, that's what a lot of people that I've talked to have, uh, found. Um, you don't find that that happens as far as you're concerned though, right? As far as, do you find, do you have more energy or not? Uh, uh- <laughs> so I think that just uh, on a day-to-day basis, sometimes I look at myself and think like, oh, I don't really have that much energy. But then I look back on all the things I've accomplished and I think, oh, I wrote like a best-selling book while I had a full-time job, while I was doing 15 other things. So um, in the big scheme of things, yes, I do think my diet better supports the kind of life I want to live. Um, I know when I eat Again, because like I said, we could go to the Chicago diner and we could really throw down on some vegan junk food. And I do. And I also drink alcohol and, you know, go out late. And, you know, I'm not again, I'm not like a person who's like, you know, my body's a temple and I never put oil or, you know, alcohol in it or anything. That's not me. But I noticed I did the Furman plan a few years ago, Uh which I don't know if you're familiar with that. That's like the nutritarian, like whole foods, plant based. Yeah, Dr. Joel Furman. Um, 
Yeah. And, and I got to tell you, when I did that, just for like three weeks, boy, howdy, I had energy. Like I didn't even know where to put it. Like I had so much energy and I lost a ton of weight. And I wish actually at this point I could get disciplined enough to stick to it for more than like a week. Cause every time I do it, I feel so great. I'm not craving a bunch of trash. I'm very clear headed. I'm not carrying around excess weight. Um, so I do think if you're eating like the real stuff, if you're eating vegetables and fruits and legumes, like, yeah, your body's going to be like, thank you. The, this is the nourishment I want and you're going to feel great. Yeah. So like a whole food plant-based diet, um, yeah. is what you're talking about. Yep. Absolutely. Not like eating 10 impossible burgers. Yeah. Like <laughs> sometimes I've been known to do <laughs> with like a glass of wine, you know? <laughs> hey, look, I'm vegan. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can, you can live off of French fries and be vegan. There are plenty I, of people who do that. Um, you know, so I have done that. I have, uh, yeah. I was, uh, over in Russia and that was, uh, that was my go-to was French fries. <laughs> So. Yeah, it's probably tough to find some of the more veg-friendly foods there. Yeah, yeah. All right, so let's get to the book, all right? The book is okay. uh, Give a Shit, Do Good, Live Better, Save the Planet, and it's about ways to change your life um, to make an impact on the environment and planet. Um, mm -hmm. how, how did you do it? First of all, I mean, uh, you just mentioned you had a full-time job. And you wrote yep. the book. I mean, a lot of people, mm -hmm. they don't even have time. They're like, I can't even find a half an hour to go work out. But you wrote an entire right. book, a bestseller, in while you had a full-time job. How did, you, yeah. how did you make that happen? Uh, I really wanted it. I really felt it was important that the book be out there in the world. I essentially wrote the kind of book I wish I had access to when I was getting into my own sustainability journey. Um, or even as like an early vegan, I wish I kind of had access to a book that was felt fun and non-judgmental and, um, gave me a lot of options. So I, you know, I'd been doing TV segments and writing for different mainstream media outlets about vegan living and eco-friendly living for about four years. And so I already knew the flow of the book and all that stuff. So by the time I worked with my literary agent on the proposal, and actually like signed a book deal, I basically had like the flow of the book pretty much set up and my publisher knew what they wanted. Like we were on the same page. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a literary pun for you. Anyway, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I, yeah, so it was pretty, I wouldn't say it was easy by any stretch, but a lot of the content was stuff that I'd been doing one-off TV segments or one-off journalistic pieces on for a long time, like cruelty-free cosmetics, fast fashion, ethical fashion, you know. And I'd also worked at a food tech startup, and I was developing vegan recipes for them for a good part of a year. Um, so I had ownership of recipes that they maybe didn't take from me or use. And so I also knew I wanted the book to have a decently robust recipe section so that it wasn't – I wanted the book to be like a one and done. You could give this book to someone – and they're going to have everything they need to get started as opposed to, oh, OK, well, I want to be kind of like eat more vegan. I guess I got to go out and get a cookbook or I guess I need to Google recipes. I wanted to have it all in there for folks. Um, so, yeah, I felt like a lot of the content I kind of, you know, when you have like an outline, you're like, OK, I know what I need to do. Mm -hmm. And I just would stay late or come home after work and write it. Like, I mean, I basically wrote the book the first stab at it the first manuscript within like three weeks. Really? And then, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, your editor edits it and, you know, it changes a lot of hands. And then a few months later you get it back and then you go through another round of edits. And uh, so, yeah, that was the, that was the process. Um, but I knew I wanted it to be out while Trump was president mm -hmm. because I felt like it was the kind of, it was a kind of message, you know, I'm all about like personal responsibility, like em empowering people to know that their individual habits and behaviors are really powerful. And I felt like that's really what was needed with this particular administration, given, you know, that we got a lot of people who don't even believe that climate change is real. Well, when you're in a, a political situation like that, you can't exactly say like, oh, let's wait for our lawmakers or our policymakers to to, you know, make some policies around this. No, 
So people were feeling pretty, ap- even more apathetic than before. And I wanted to give them essentially like a toolbox where they could feel less apathetic and more like they can, they, there's a lot they can actually do. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a great reference. I, I use it uh, all the time. And in, in fact, my daughter used it for a uh, project at school, my 15 year old about, uh, about water use. So, I mean, oh, that's awesome. yeah, there's so much stuff in it and it, and that, uh, I got the audible version. So it's like the PDF that comes along with it. Uh, like you said, oh, cool. it's got recipes and cleaning information and just a, a ton of stuff to, to jumpstart any vegan or, or help even somebody like me who's, you know, I'm seven years in and I'm like, Oh yeah, I, I could do that. That's pretty easy. You know? So I, I think that that's, what's, uh, that's, what's fantastic about it. Oh, Fred, that's so awesome to hear. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, I I absolutely loved, like, uh, chapter three, the give a shit in the kitchen part. I just, I mean, like, how long does it take to, to gather all of those facts? I mean, you know, you're like, you're just, like, even when you're just reading it, you're just like, and obviously you know your stuff, but it's just so much facts in that, that... There was a lot. Yeah. How do you research? I mean, I mean, yeah, you have this, you have this idea of how the flow is going to go and you have, Mm -hmm. um, you have, I don't know how you do it, but three weeks, I don't know how much time you were spending at work, but, but three weeks, it seems pretty, pretty quick. You know, you're like, okay, so I got this idea. I signed this book deal. I got three weeks. I can just um, mm-hmm. I don't know, maybe you type a lot faster than I do, but I mean, I type pretty fast, but, and I was still doing very much like my concentrated job during the day. So it just, yeah, the research took a lot of time, but it was important to me, not just to back up like what I was saying, it was important to me. You'll notice, um, and I don't know if it's in the audio version, but in the actual book, there is a huge index in the back of all of the sources are cited. I have a lot, a lot of um, end notes and footnotes in this book um, because I wanted to back every single assertion up. And I also wanted to be very transparent with people about where I got my data I think part of that is I come from a background. Um, I was a social worker, but I have a master's in evidence-based social work. And uh, so I did a lot of statistics. I've, you know, I'm no stranger to writing pretty lengthy dissertations. And I knew it was important for people to give people like the why and the background behind where this information is coming from and make sure those sources are pretty credible. So that did take up a ton of time. Like I tell people like, you know, definitely if you've got a book on your heart that you want to write, you should. Um, I went a traditional publishing route. Some people self-publish, but don't, I wouldn't say like, like not like, unless you're John Grisham or JK Rowling or something, writing a book is not necessarily like a tremendous money-making endeavor. It's also a huge, huge amount of work. That's why, you know, most book deals, people get an advance and they get that advance to live off of while they're concentrating on their book, I just chose to steam through because that's just kind of how I am. (laughs) (laughs) That's just how I am, Fred, you know? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, I'm looking at the, uh, at the information right now and there are so many sources that are cited. It's, it's actually, uh, it's, uh, surprising. You know what I mean? It's like, it's gotta be like 30 to 40 sources per chapter. Um, yeah, at least. And I, I, I think that one of the things that surprised me was the whole, uh, the CAFOs, uh, mm. statement yeah. that, that you brought up. Could you explain a little more about that? Yeah. So CAFOs are large scale feeding operations for uh, traditionally farmed animals in the United States. Um, they are where I would say at this point about mm, 95 to 98% of all of the meat, dairy, chick, chicken, um, eggs, all that stuff comes from. Um, and I wanted to talk about those because, well, one, CAFOs are not things that you see in, in or near major cities. So they're intentionally hidden, I think, from sight because they know that if people saw that kind of stuff, they would probably find it quite distressing. Um, Moreover, CAFOs are incredibly polluting to not just the environment at large, but to nearby communities. And I talk about that as far as, 
You know, you have so many animals, thousands and thousands of animals crammed into one place. They're creating a lot of excrement. Where does that go? Um, so I, I go into detail around how they're managing the waste at these capos. And these are, these are kind of quote unquote regulated practices. So there are, you know, perfectly accepted governmental regulations around how these CAFOs um, dispose of dead animals, sick and downed animals, excrement. And one of the perfectly acceptable ways to get rid of excrement is to have all that stuff like in these large um, lagoons or pools, essentially, that are just like full of shit. And those create a lot of gases. Um, they also can sick in nearby communities. So there's been pretty good documented evidence that if you live even miles and miles within a CAFO, people experience very strange respiratory issues that you don't see um, in other areas that aren't near CAFOs. Um, and the other acceptable way to, to dispose of waste is to spray it into the air with a hose. Um, which also creates a lot of problems. Uh, moreover, these animals are given, you know, when you, anytime you have a bunch of animals together in mass, there are going to be issues. Um, and we see this actually with the outbreak of the coronavirus mm -hmm. in China. Um, the issue there is not so much that people are eating animals. Um, it's rather that in rural communities in this particular province in China, it's largely believed that it's healthier to eat freshly slaughtered animals, which in an area where there's not a lot of widespread refrigeration isn't necessarily something that, I mean, that sounds like pretty sound, right? Mm -hmm. Like I would rather, eat, if I was still eating animals, I would probably, and I don't have a refrigerator any way to keep it fresh, I would probably think, yeah, you want to slaughter the animal right before you eat it because that makes more sense. So then what happens is a lot of animals are trucked in from other areas and sometimes they'll wait you know, five, six, seven days in their own waste crammed together. And that's what breeds a ton of viruses and like things that can sicken not just the animals, but people when they ingest it. The same goes for, in some ways, CAFOs. You've got a lot of animals together. Those animals are given a lot of antibiotics so that they don't get sick. Um, and actually most, and I talk about this in the book, more antibiotics are given to farmed animals in the United States than to people many, many, many times over. Um, and this is because farmers know exactly like that you what we're talking about here. Right. You put a lot of animals together, they're going to get sick. It's not a good practice. Um, and a lot of those hormones and antibiotics and things that are given to the animals, they seep into the water, into the soil, into you know the excrement. So there's a lot of um, like the attribution of superbugs, for instance, these these like bugs that people can't get over that no antibiotic can cure right. has been linked back to factory farming because these animals have been given all of these antibiotics. They're then, you know, going into the ground, into the water. We're drinking the water. We're growing things from the ground. And, you know, in turn, we're suddenly finding it's really, really difficult to get over certain illnesses with common medicine. Um, so that's my big diet. Thanks for coming to my TED talk on CAFOs. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot about CAFOs that, um, you know, and, and we could also talk about there's labor issues there. There are a lot of human rights issues that go on in the food system. Um, a lot of immigration issues that go on in the food system. But generally, CAFOs, I consider to be important to talk about because you do have folks, when you start talking about veganism or vegetarianism, who say, oh, well, I get my meat um, from fair sources or from humane sources. And I want us all to have like a real come to Jesus talk that unless you were going to a neighbor who slaughtered that freaking like animal by himself, one, we can't guarantee that's humane. I think humane slaughter is a myth anyway. But two, you, there is no way for people to guarantee that like an animal that they're eating has not been raised at a cafe. It's very, very difficult because the way that the regulations are, you can still have something that's, you know, not a CAFO, but it's not necessarily like any improvement over a CAFO. It's still thousands of animals crammed together, never seeing sunlight, never touching grass, getting sick, eating each other when they die. You know, it's like a nightmare. Right. So I think it's important for people to be realistic that like unless you have a farm of your own, a very small scale organic farm, um, you're, if you eat out, if you buy your meat at the grocery store, you're pretty much still getting meat that's from a factory farming operation. Yeah. And I, I just, I guess it was very enlightening for me because I just found 
like I, I had no idea. I mean, obviously I, I knew that there was factory farms and stuff, but I had no idea to the extent that you go into it in the book. And mm -hmm. I was just, um, really surprised by, you know, it all makes sense when you think about it, but a lot of times you don't think about it. And a lot of times people don't think about like, Oh, there's a Burger King on every block. There's a, you know, there's meat everywhere. Where does that all come from? They don't think like that. They, they just think, Oh, I'm just going to go to the steak restaurant or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. it all comes from someplace And this. And for me to, to realize that whole you know, and then you go into all of the uh, extra parts of it and you're just like, wow, this is really a problem. And it's and it's really something that that people don't even know exists. Yeah. And, and by that is by design. You know, the food system that we have in the United States, it's really interesting, like how we are having a conversation about the coronavirus and how there's a lot of vilification of the Chinese people. Um, because they eat things that maybe we don't eat in the United States, right? Which I think is bullshit anyway, because, like, who's to say what we should be eating and what we should... Like, who's to say a horse is more valuable than a pig, is more valuable than a bat? Or a anyway, dog. Um, or a dog, exactly. Um, but I think it's quite in interesting because our food system, compared to that of other countries, is one that is entirely designed to keep us with blinders on as to what the hell we're actually eating. So, you know, these animals that are going to slaughter most of the time, capo so capos raise the animals or fatten them up for slaughter. Mm -hmm. And then they're transported to slaughterhouses, usually at night, usually on as le le like the least trafficked routes possible. So most of the time people don't see like, um, you know, a caravan of animals bound for slaughter on a popular highway during rush hour. Right. That's like not when you're going to see them. You're going to see them like, ooh, three in the morning when you happen to be driving cross country to go to your grandmother's house or something. Right. Right. So uh, that's by design because they know people find that incredibly distressing to see that um, because it is. Mm -hmm. And slaughterhouses don't have freaking windows. They don't, you know, I, I worked at the food tech startup I worked at was in the West Loop of Chicago. Um, and there were, it was surrounded by a lot of slaughterhouses because it was a traditional meat packing area. And every, uh, day around lunchtime, there would be a truck that would come around and in these large plastic trash cans, these guys would dump thousands and thousands of snouts and tails and hooves into this big truck. They were all like the byproducts of the slaughter oh. and they would hose down the sidewalk. I mean, this, they were hosed down the sidewalk, but up until they had that truck come by, the whole place was like locked down like Fort Knox. You wouldn't see any of that stuff. It was only like at that exact time when the people would come, I guess, to get like the tops and tails of the animals. Um, so and then you go into a grocery store and aside from chicken, which we call chicken, we call cows beef. You know, we, right. we right. like pigs are bacon, right? Pigs are pork bacon or pork. Exactly. And so there's a real dissociation um, uh, from the animals. We hear every day somebody goes to, you know, KFC or whatever, and they're freaking out because there was a vein in their chicken or there was a foot right. in their chicken. And it's like, well, no shit, person like this <laughs> actually came from an animal. So. Uh, I find it very interesting because you go to other countries and people aren't squeamish about that right. kind of stuff because they are a little bit m more closely connected to what they are eating. So here, not only is our food system jacked, but we have undergone this kind of uh, unwitting cultural conditioning of we just we are so removed from what we're actually eating. And that's why you get people met, like myself who will sit there and say, Oh God, I love animals. And then they'll go to McDonald's. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's, that's, that's why it happens. Yeah. That's, uh, I just, I just find that, um, to be like startling, you know what I mean? That, that mm -hmm. I'm, and I used to be like that. And yeah, we were totally like that, Fred. Now with the disconnect, uh, mm -hmm. I know that a lot of people always tell me, well, I, I just don't want to know about it. I don't want to hear that. Um, do you find that as well? I mean, especially with your book and everything like that, where you're telling people, basically, this is this is what's happening. 
And Mm -hmm. do you find that in reviews and stuff like that where people are either like, you know, grateful or like, don't tell me, I didn't want to know. Um, I hear, so the reviews for the book have been pretty overwhelmingly positive. I'm very grateful for that. There are always, as with anything you put out in the public, a few people, and I really mean it, there are only a few. Sure. And I read the reviews every day on all the different, you know, mediums. But um, there are a few people who don't like the book, largely because of that in the kitchen section, where I talk very, I talk pretty in depth about all of the reasons our food system is broken. Um, and all of the reasons why veganism is a really good first step to solving some of that. So I can tell, I see a lot of myself in these folks because there is like an inherent defensiveness, um, when you start talking about people's food choices and maybe, oh, maybe they might want to consider making a change, you know, and I see that in, you know, I work at a fortune 50 company, um, people there, are very supportive of and know that I've released a book and that I am very passionate about sustainability. They know I'm vegan. Mm -hmm. Um, and still there are folks who like, you know, don't want to, they're happy to get into it with me about, you know, paleo or how our ancestors ate in this way or what would happen to all the animals if whatever. Right. But once I actually start responding, then they're like, "Ah, I don't want to hear it. No, I don't want to hear it. And so, I don't really engage with, I don't instigate that kind of conversation mm-hmm. um, anymore because I have found, and I'm sure you have probably too, when I was an early vegan, I was very, very into this. I was like, and I'm still into it, but I was like so militant about it. And I just, now that at that time, when I thought I'd seen the light and like I couldn't understand how other people also weren't seeing it. And now I'm a little more laid back. I know that people aren't going to change unless they really want to. Um, And I've just seen a lot more. My relationships are a lot better without me trying to change people over to this way. And I've also seen a lot of people in my life who I never would have thought would even remotely be interested in some of this stuff have completely done like a 180. Like my family is pretty conservative. Mm -hmm. We are politically not aligned. My family... Uh, thought it was very weird when I went vegan. And now uh, that I am, it's just like such a part of my life. It'll be interesting. My dad will text me and be like, Hey, I think I had a vegan day today. Um, He's not (laughs) intentionally trying to do that, but he's kind of like aware that he has done that. Or, you know, my mom and her boyfriend, uh, whenever I go down there for Thanksgiving, My mom, this past Thanksgiving, made an entirely vegan Thanksgiving. It was awesome. Wow. And I was so excited and grateful for that. So um, I think people change in surprising ways, but I get a lot of people who want to actually spar with me about this stuff. And um, I find it really interesting because it's usually men. Also, it's usually men I'm dating, to be honest. (laughs) And, um, And I just have to straight up say, like, listen, I totally respect where you're coming from. I don't find it like relaxing or fun to get into these kinds of conversations that are like contentious mm-hmm. because I've already spent my time trying to educate the public about what I know and I think is pretty important. So like if you're really curious, I'm happy to have like a respectful dialogue about it, but I also don't want it to feel like, it's, you know, it's getting into like a fight right. or something. Yeah. Um, and it can go that way pretty quickly, I think, just with people who aren't in a place where they want to hear it or they're very defensive. So I just usually don't engage in it. Right. And I tell other people, don't bother. If somebody's really curious, they'll ask you a question. Exactly. Exactly. I find about it. Yeah, I find that happens a lot. Uh people Do you? Yeah. People People step into you from? Yeah, they they <laughs> <laughs> they they uh give me some good natured ribbing, shall we say. You know, and then but then kind of you know, later on, somebody will come up to me and they'll be like, oh, so um, what what is it that you're doing exactly? You know, like, how how are you doing it? And how does this work? And how do you feel? And just like all of those type of uh, things. And it's usually an aside, a one on one as opposed to a, a group thing. Um, mm-hmm. So, it, you know, it, it's like you said, it's 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 information and they're happy to share their information about, I don't know, going to the uh, sanctuary and bringing their kids there. And, and then they 
go and have a burger. And I'm like, it doesn't make any sense. How do you, how do you not understand that? But like you said, you can't, right. you can't change people's minds. They have to change them themselves. So, um, that's so true. Where do you go from here? I mean, like, uh, are you got another book in the, uh, in the, in the plans or, um, what are your plans? Do you have yeah. any? Do you have any? <laughs> Do I have any? Gosh, I have a lot actually, um, that I'm very excited about. So my plan is, you know, I wasn't doing as much television, um, in the past year because the book has the word shit in the title and you can't show it or say it on TV. Hmm. Um, now that the book is, has been out for about a year and a half and it's still got great momentum, it's doing well. Um, I, I'm planning on getting back into TV more. I think people are just so much more interested in how they can live more sustainably and what they can do. Um, so I think the time is right for that. As far as like another book, I'm really not sure. My hope is that the one I already wrote is pretty comprehensive and fits the bill for what people need. But if it turns out there's something else, uh, that needs to be done, I'm not opposed to writing another one. Um, but mostly I'm making the rounds also in kind of, I speak a lot at events, which I really love doing. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm finding yet again, like really, it's really interesting to see how many businesses and organizations want somebody to come and keynote about sustainability. So that, that's been, that's going to be keeping me really busy in the new year. And, um, you know, just, I'm always, uh, I'm always open to hits of inspiration, but really right now, those are kind of my two main areas of focus um, is, is to continue to get the word out there, but I'm not planning on stopping doing this work anytime soon. It's, it's, you know, I feel like it really is my passion and my life's mission. So. Right. Um, fun. what's new for you, Fred? Oh, lots of stuff. We got lots of stuff coming up on plant your seed. I can't wait. Um, finally, could you give me one word to describe how you felt before you became vegan and one word to describe how you feel now that you are vegan? Interesting. That's a really good one. What a freaking good question. Um, before I went vegan, I wouldn't attribute this word to just becoming vegan or not being vegan, but there were a lot of things in my life that didn't quite feel like they were uh, congruent with who I am. So I would say I felt pretty stressed and now I actually feel very aligned. I feel like the things I'm doing, I'm much more like our, the way I'm living as a, as an ethical vegan is so much more aligned with my values and who I've always wanted to be as a person. And then that just became part of my job as well, which I think is kind of cool. So I would say aligned. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah. now it was such a pleasure speaking with you. Can you please, oh God, you can you please just tell people how to find you? Obviously the book, give a shit, do good, live better, save the planet. Um, yep. but, uh, where can they get a hold of you on Instagram, the web, social media, all of that? Yeah, absolutely. So my website is a S H L E E P I P E R.com. Um, and I'm pretty much only on Instagram these days. And that's also my name, Ashley with two E's Piper, no spaces, no nothing. Um, yeah. And that's where I'm at. And I'm actually very responsive to messages and I love hearing from readers and folks. I mean, we're all in this together. So it's, it's, it's really cool to see this community grow. And thanks to you, Fred, for all you're doing with this great podcast too. I'm, it's been a pleasure chatting with you and honor to be on here. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I really, I really do appreciate it. Hope you are inspired by this story and remember it's never too late to plant your seed. Links to everything we talked about on the podcast can be found on Instagram at plant.yourseed in the show notes tab in the bio. If you enjoyed the show, remember to leave us a review. And until next time, thank you for listening.